All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Greg Niemeyer. I'm a uh, professor of our practice, and we're teaching uh, Letters and Science 25, Creativity in Practice. And today, on this beautiful day of October 21st, we have a very special guest lecture by my esteemed colleague uh, and uh, celebrated fiction writer, Aya de Leon. So I'm really thrilled to have you here today and uh, look forward to your thoughts. But before, we're going to do a few observations. I just want to point out that uh, at Gray Area in San Francisco, there is a um, event happening this whole weekend, kind of a festival of new media. Um, and if you're interested in worlding protocols and creating new worlds with virtual ideas, um, um, I'd recommend this event to you. It's got a, a nocturne, it's got an evening events, it's got night events. It's, I think it's kind of a mix between a, a lecture and a conference and a rave. And uh, it's always a healthy lecture, it seems to me. And several of our grad students, including uh, Tiare Ribo, are um, presenting there. And uh, so if you're interested in digital media, that would be definitely something to check out. Um, I want to mention that our next speaker is going to be uh, computer science and uh, Professor uh, Marty Hurst, who's uh, in the School of Information, and who teaches uh, uh, interface and uh, uh, visualizations of data. And uh, she's going to talk about innovation. And uh, so that's going to be new tools, more of a new tools discussion. And uh, she's going to talk about patents and inventions and what sustains inventions uh, for her personally, but also for the nation. So it's going to be very interesting. And today, our guest speaker is Aya de Leon. Aya is a, a professor of African American studies at UC Berkeley and uh, obtained a BA from Harvard University, mm -hmm. uh, then an MFA from Antioch University, Los Angeles, which I looked up because I wanted to learn more about it. Turns out it was a really interesting alternate model for how to teach and how to take courses and how to graduate. And it was uh, founded, I think, in 1902, or it's actually a pretty old, but it's also really radically innovative and really broad and inclus inclusive and supportive of many different people's paths to education, I think, more so than a regular university. And I thought it was really, really inspiring. So uh, I got her MFA from there and uh, launched her career with uh, spoken word poetry and uh, 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 was uh, well known for Thieves in the Temple, the reclaiming of hip hop, and uh, eventually published her first uh, a, a novel uh, that is a, of a, of a, it's called a genre novel, Uptown Thief, I believe 2016, is that correct? And then uh, from then on, was able to write a new book every year, which is uh, totally different from what we talked about when we talked about Vikram's work, where we learned that he writes a book every seven years and that there's 18,000 web pages that he consults just for one book. And uh, I, I was like, no, no, I don't do that. I just write what I need to say. And it's very direct and it comes out once a year. So uh, very excitingly out now is Queen of Urban Prophecy. And that's um, her latest novel from 2021. So Aya de Leon is an American novelist and activist who teaches at the University of California, Berkeley. She first came to national attention as a spoken word artist in the underground poetry scene, San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, a hip hop theater artist, and as a hip hop theater artist. The de Leon is uh, of Puerto Rican, African-American, West Indian heritage, and much of her work explores issues of race, gender, socioeconomic class, body, nation, and the climate change crisis. And indeed, we, indeed we all learn, uh, read your book, um, Spy in the Struggle, and uh, these topics do all come up there in wonderful ways. In addition to, um, I also noticed that the topic of labor comes up a lot. And so we're really grateful for your book, and we were both entertained and enthralled and transformed, and we're really honored to have you here today. Please join me in welcoming Aya de Leon. Thank you so much. Uh, what a great introduction. Yes, I'm very excited. Um, and Queen of Urban Prophecy actually will be out in December. So that is my uh, 2021 book. Although, as you'll hear, uh, let me make sure my slides are coming. Yes. As you'll hear, I am um, very inspired by the climate crisis to write a lot in a crisis mode. Um, okay. Here we go. Um, so I want to talk, start just by talking about creativity generally. And I want to say everyone is creative, and creativity is an innate human characteristic. As Albert Einstein said, creativity is intelligence having fun. 
And I think it's important to know that creativity is our birthright. Children are naturally creative and they're not self-conscious about it at all. It's natural for kids to create and want attention from those they love for their creations, which is why sometimes we put art on the wall or on the refrigerator. So children are naturally filled with wonder about the world, but eventually in most of our societies, young people are criticized compared to other people, their creations are ignored, or they're told, you know, it's time to grow out of those kinds of things. And unfortunately, young people are also told about what they can't do. For example, people are told, you can't sing, you can't dance. And I think what's important here is to understand it's not about people being unable to do something. For example, Axis Dance teaches us that people with mobility disabilities, for example, in wheelchairs, can dance. It's not actually about an inability of motion. It's about an inability to suspend judgment and enjoy. So you can dance if you move your body with or without music, and you can sing if your voice produces notes that are or are not in key with the song that people are expecting. Art is about doing. To be an artist is both a description of something we do, and here is an example of a British visual artist in the 1980s. Sometimes we do this art as paid work, sometimes as fun, sometimes as both, and it can be an identity, but people can be creative without having the artist identity, or someone can have an artist identity without actually being a practicing artist. And there are many myths and stereotypes of artists. We're told that artists are kind of crazy, or artists are special, or artists are elite. Um, and part of this, this question of this notion of elitism, is that art is often associated with the owning class. And some people will say, oh, I'd love to make art and I'll do it if I win the lottery. But in reality, most artists are part of the working class. Not only do we working artists work, but we work under difficult conditions in many societies. Our labor is exploited in that we only get a fraction of what our creations are worth on the market, and we're forced to work under circumstances in which we're constantly criticized, compared to others, and where we have to compete with each other for resources. Making art is a situation in which many of us who do it are riddled with self-doubt. This is a bit like the harsh conditions under which students are expected to get a college education. These are harsh systems. But art is necessary, for in particular, in our society here in the US, capitalism needs artists to make life bearable. We write the books people read on the bus on the way to their jobs, we make the stories people watch on their laptops after work. We make the music people listen to on the weekends when they dance out all the stress. If most people in our society didn't have these outlets, they would find life intolerable. So the society needs to exploit the artists who make all these products. Because if making art was easy and accessible and you could make a living from the beginning, how would they get people to do the jobs that the people didn't love? And many of us really want to build lives with creativity at the center. And I say, yes, go for it. But understand, it will be a fight. If you're not independently wealthy and you want to be an artist, you can do it. But you have to be ready to fight against both internal and external obstacles. So when I was in my teens and my 20s, I knew I wanted to be an artist but it was really hard to write. I had trouble getting to the page. I was disappointed with a lot of what I could write as, a, as a, a new writer. And I had a lot of insecurity. And I also had trouble sitting still and sitting with myself in the process of writing. I was easily distracted. Like most deaf says, restlessness is my nemesis. It's hard to just chill and sit still. But my response to that was that I ended up getting a fair amount of therapy, and now it's easier to sit with myself. Um, and I find that being able to write and be pleased 
with what I write has to do with being able to sit with myself and being able to be pleased with myself. I also have an anthem. Um, the song is Unwritten by Natasha Bedingfield. And when I feel stuck or blocked, like I can't write, like even though I finally have a chunk of time where I could write, I feel unmotivated, this anthem is my secret weapon. I turn it up loud in my headphones and I have a good cry. It has that kind of swelling music that brings tears to my eyes. I only play it when I need to use it for this purpose. Because the lyrics of the song remind me that I really, really want this. I want to be creative and it taps into those emotions for me and it works every time. So those are some strategies I've had for a few serious internal obstacles, but there have also been sig significant external obstacles. For example, the entire structure of graduate schools in creative writing are stacked against the kind of stories that I write. So here I'm quoting Brian Merchant in Motherboard. He says, in a lengthy piece for the Chronicle of Higher Education, writing professor Eric Bennett makes a case that the Iowa MFA program, arguably the most influential force in modern American literature, was profoundly shaped by, wait for it, a CIA-backed effort to promote a brand of literature that trumpeted American individualism and materialism over airy socialistic ideals, okay? So Bennett is explaining the impact of anti-communism and growing conservatism on US literature and how the funding and the ideological backing actually changed the way young writers were educated. So instead, these programs have championed um, what Merchant refers to as the granular domestic fiction that's dominated the American post-war literary tradition. And this tradition frowns on genre fiction, or as um, I refer to my own work, popular fiction, sometimes called pulp fiction. It frowns on socially engaged fiction. But more than that, this granular domestic fiction is very, very white and middle class. And these dominant identities are normalized as the people and the stories that are worthy of being the focus of our literature, which means that people of color, women, LGBTQIA folks, people with disabilities, poor and working class people, rural people, people from outside the US, to write outside of those dominant identities is considered political, right? So when we write about people of color, women, other folks who are marginalized, it's considered political. But to write inside those dominant identities about white and middle class folks or owning class folks is considered just normal. So it's not just about this granular domestic fiction, it's also about fiction, that focuses on the usual suspects. So part of what it makes, part of what makes it hard for many of us to write is that we live in those parts of the human experience that have been deemed unworthy of literary attention. And I write about women of color, poor and working class women. Sometimes I write about sex workers. Sometimes I write about folks who are undocumented immigrants. My latest book, just came out last week is called The Mystery Woman in Room 3. Technically, it's not a book, it's a novel because it's being published serially on Orion Magazine online. It is available for free. Part two just went live today and it is a young adult thriller. All right, there's The Mystery Woman in Room 3. So a description of the story. High school sophomore Amandis Castillo came undocumented to Florida when her mom fled an abusive relationship in the Dominican Republic. After school, Amandis goes to the Miami area nursing home where her mom works. Amandis generally sneaks into the room of the unconscious patient they call La Rica, the rich lady. La Rica's only visitor is a nurse who gives her a daily injection. 
But on one of Florida's sunny flood days, when the nurse forgets the injection, La Rica regains consciousness. You have to help me, she tells Amandis. They're keeping me sedated. Amandis hides as two nurses and a cop sedate La Rica and put her on an IV. Amandis' English is not good enough to fully understand what happened. Her mother tells her to keep her mouth shut for fear of getting deported. Amandis is new at school, but she approaches her language buddy, Mariluna, a Dominican refugee from Hurricane Maria who had been living in Puerto Rico. The girls plot to remove the IV and talk to La Rica. She turns out to be Jane Samuelson, the Florida senator who had been missing for several weeks. Samuelson was known for her heavy makeup and dyed red hair. Without this artifice, she is nearly unrecognizable. Samuelson recently changed her position on the Green New Deal. Martin Miller, the GOP, the GOP Senate minority leader, was counting on her to vote against it. Some of Miller's associates have kidnapped her and are holding her at the nursing home until after the vote on the Senate floor. Without Samuelson's support, the bill will fall short of the 60-vote filibuster-proof majority needed to pass. At school, the two girls approach Heidi, who leads the environmental club, and Davion, who edits the school newspaper. These four teens must go up against some of the most powerful forces in the nation, all while Amandis and Mariluna are vulnerable to deportation. As the climate crisis continues to escalate, the four of them realize that the fate of the planet may be at stake. But without knowing whom they can trust, will the four of them be able to smuggle Senator Samuelson to Washington in time? So um, I just want to say that uh, I'm going to read a little section from the first part. And it refers to this, uh, it refers to a sunny flood day. And due to climate change, there are uh, floods in frontline communities on days when it doesn't even rain, right? Because things have been so disrupted, sea level rise, and the changes. Okay, so this is just a very short uh, excerpt from The Mystery Woman in Room 3. It's in Amandis' voice, and uh, it's written in English, but in her mind and in her words, she would be speaking Spanish. Usually, I slip into Shady Orchard's nursing home and no one notices. With enough staff coming and going, I blend in. Mommy often hides a sandwich for me behind the fake plants in the lobby that I grab before heading to La Rica's room to do my homework. But not today. Today, the building has been partially evacuated due to the flooding. Apparently, all the sandbags weren't enough to keep the water from spilling in through the hallway and down into the multi-purpose room on the basement floor. They're not letting anyone into the building for the time being. Now what do I do? Our last apartment in the Dominican Republic had doorknobs that didn't exactly fit some of the doors. The previous owner had changed the original knobs for newer, fancier ones, but they didn't have pins that were long enough for the older, thicker doors. If you didn't open the doors just right, the knob would fall off, and then we'd be looking around on the floor for the hardware. We put the knobs back on and attempt to screw them in place, but it wasn't a good fit, so the screws would barely go in, and the knob would come off in your hand if you didn't pay attention. Our whole life in the United States is like that. Nothing screwed in securely. We don't have papers to be here legally. We don't have a bank account. We don't have family here or a lot of cash, so we can't rent an apartment. And now the security guards are blocking my way into shady orchards, all loose pins dropping all the time. Mommy and I stay in a rooming house that's sketchy. We have our own room with two locks on the door, but we share a bathroom and people are going in and out all the time. That's why we came up with the plan for me to come to Shady Orchards after school. Mommy gets paid in cash to cook here, so that's good, but she can't really have her daughter hanging out. I need to be invisible until we can afford a better situation. Invisibility is easy in the early afternoon. The day nursing supervisor doesn't pay attention to who comes in. I can walk right past her and she'll never ask what I'm doing there. But the evening supervisor, the one with the blonde bun and green scrubs is all eyes and ears. She comes on at 4.45 and after that, I need to stay hidden. The security guard keeps us outside and I watch the minutes tick away. 3.55, 4.25, 4.40, I'm hungry the whole time. 
So this is a story of a young woman of color who's trying to be invisible, but this story is about making her visible. So what about you? Whatever your background, if some of your identities fall into dominant groups and others fall into marginalized groups, however that shakes down, you are part of the human experience. And whatever's on your mind is a valid literary thought. So I'm gonna invite you to do an exercise. Get a piece of paper or a phone or a laptop, anything you can write on. And I'm going to ask you to write an opening line to a novel. It could be anything. So just imagine that whatever is on your mind could be the opening line to a novel. So here are some things that might be on people's minds that seem very everyday. They better have my almond milk in stock when I get to the grocery store or I'm going to fucking lose it. So that could be the opening line to a novel. Or, how the hell am I gonna finish two 10-hour shifts at work this weekend and study for three midterms? That could be the opening line to a novel. Yes, California needs the water, but did it have to rain on the day when I need to commute across town on a bike with no fenders? Or, she was exhausted. She sat down in the back of the dark lecture hall so the presenter wouldn't see if she fell asleep. Bam, okay. So go ahead and take a minute just to write any line and then you can go home and say, yeah, I wrote the opening line to a novel today. Whether or not you write the rest of the novel. Ten more seconds. Okay, so feel free to finish that novel uh, at some point if you choose. So I write about women of color mostly uh, who are raised poor and working class. And I write a lot of trauma, the traumas associated with racism, sexism, and poverty. I have lived some of these, and members of my family and extended community have lived others of these. And I put in lots of time personally to heal from these traumas because that is the good news. Trauma can be healed. For me, writing was part of the healing process, believing that my voice mattered and that the stories I wanted to tell about my people and my community were important. It took decades, but I'm finally where I want to be as a writer. So this book, A Spy in the Struggle, I started in my early 20s. And here is how I opened the book originally. Well, not originally. It was sort of an interim draft 13 years ago. You may recognize this because it pops up towards the end of the book. And so I had... Uh, one typical thing that happens in genre fiction is you start in the climax and you show like, here's some moment of like um, big climactic drama and then you go back and you say, and here's how we got there. So I started with that. Everything between Yolanda Vance and the mail slot was the enemy. Every square of sidewalk under her running sneakers, every traffic light, every insect that flew past distracting her. Behind the dark wraparound glasses, her eyes scanned every car, every pedestrian. She ran against the traffic on a one-way street so no, car would, so no car could follow, and so fast that few could have kept up on foot. Her sneakers struck the ground in a rhythm that should have synchronized with the beat on her headphones, but there was no music, only conversation. She ran in time to the song of eavesdropping, surveillance. So that was one of my um, earlier openings. And, you know, I struggled a lot with this book. Oh, originally it was called Surveillance was the title. And then the interim title that I worked with was Operation Hologram. But my editor didn't like either of those. And then we ended up with A Spy in the Struggle, which I think is much better. Um, so initially I tried to fit this book more into traditional MFA rules about what made a book worthy. I'm going to go back to Bryant Merchant's um, article, and here are some visuals. This is um, Merchant in Motherboard is referring to Eric Bennett's article in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. So according to Merchant, gritty realism, 
F. Scott Fitzgeraldism or magical realism were the only acceptable modes of literature. And so for me, encountering that um, directive, I tried to play with different things. Um, one thing I tried was gritty realism, which means that hopelessness is seen as more chic. The essayist Rebecca Solnit says, despair is a black leather jacket that everyone looks good in. Hope is a frilly pink dress that exposes the knees. I love that quote because it's true, despair is seen as cool and chic, but it actually doesn't get us where we need to go. Because social movements require hope. The CIA-backed literature machine posits that happy endings are juvenile, unsophisticated, and not worth elevating. And this is part of why we don't have a strong literature of social protest in the US starting in the second half of the 20th century. Before that, even a lot of the white guys were writing about issues of race, class, and political power. John Steinbeck, William Faulkner, Upton Sinclair, George Orwell, Orwell's dystopian novel 1984 was a classic. It wasn't dismissed as science fiction and fantasy and put on a lesser shelf. So I'm not giving up my hopeful endings. In an early version of A Spy in the Struggle, Yolanda was killed. I thought that made it more gritty realism. But then I decided no way. I want to write books where everyday people fight for social justice and win. But I felt the need to make it more literary. literary. So at one point, I tried for a magical realism opening. Um, and to make it sort of more magical realism, I have this fictional town of Holloway, and I created this like crazy kind of Bay Area environmental disaster opening where, um, so Holloway is imaginary, but it's next to the freeway, sort of like Richmond. And I imagined that this oil tanker crashed into the freeway. And then I could describe this disastrous moment in all these kind of like flowery language. So that's what I have here. So this is my, uh, this is an interim opening for the novel. When the massive oil tanker collided with the eight lane Northern California freeway, the road itself gasped. At 1.26 AM, the few eyewitnesses who heard the gasp mistook the sound as their own. An involuntary exclamation of shock made in a situation so distressing that one's voice sounds like a resonant, disembodied echo from without. Motorists on the freeway itself couldn't hear the gasp over the sounds of their car engines as a handful of them sped along, blissfully unaware, before the bellowing crunch of steel against cement, then the shrieking of brakes, the skidding of tires, and the crunching of safety glass. The tanker's hull split the lanes of sea level highway like a bright red box cutter slicing through a gray ribbon. While miraculously no one was injured, the prow of the tanker severed the trunk cleanly from a car of travelers and sent it spinning, the scraping metal of the car tracing a firework of sparks against the asphalt. If the helicopters had already been there, they would have seen the car tracing a loop-de-loop -loop pattern like a child's sparkler twirled in the air as if the car were celebrating the arrival of the ship. When the car stopped spinning, the three recently dozing inhabitants found themselves miraculously safe yet terrified, all grabbing cell phones and simultaneously reporting the disaster to 911, oblivious of each other telling the same story like a frantic F echo, ship, Gigantic, oh fuck, ship, broken, nearly killed, freeway, oh fuck. After the call, one of them would stagger out, dazed and shaking, to get a marijuana joint out of the trunk, only to find the car ended after the back seat. And then he would look out to see himself standing at the edge of newly minted low rolling hills made of crushed freeway, leading to the sheer face of the steel ship, a sudden mountain towering above him, blotting out the light of the stars and moon. And that's when he would feel the rumble of the ground beneath him and the belching cough as the oil began to seep out of the tanker and fill the crevices of the wrecked freeway, lap onto the remaining lanes and seep out into the San Francisco Bay. Anyway, 
So I was like, I had this whole kind of literary wild opening and I went to a writing workshop with um, the fabulous Bay Area writer, Elma, Elmaz Abinader. And she was like, cut all that out. That's not really part of your story. So I cut it. Um, but beyond that, I had to work through my feelings of internalized classism that I was writing genre fiction, popular fiction, spy fiction. I wasn't going to be getting all the laurels from the literary industry. I needed to stop trying to be something I wasn't. I wasn't writing the kind of books the literary industry seemed to want from black writers. And I got a lot of rejections, some from literary agents who really liked my work, but they just didn't think they could sell it. There were times that I worried I'd never make it as a writer and I hit a very deep pit of despair. But you'll remember how I said I had done a lot of therapy and I was part of a peer counseling community that told me that all hopelessness and despair is really not happening in the present. It's an old feeling about something that happened in the past, convincing you that bad things will happen in the future. It doesn't mean that everything in the future will be all sunshine. But how does it make sense to assume that the future will be all bad? We don't know what it is. It's in the future. It's just as unrealistic to assume that everything in the future will be good, but it's logical to hope for good things. Unless, of course, we have trauma from hard things that happened in the past. Then we are projecting those bad experiences onto the future. So when I felt hopeless or stuck or despairing as a writer, I learned to work on healing the trauma from my early life. And sure enough, it has worked. I cry or rage about hard things that happened in my past, and I return to that place of hope and possibility. Um, that place of the creative child who's excited about the new day. Which is why it's so important for the climate crisis that we help people to work through their early traumas. People get bad news about the climate and they just collapse into despair. No people, we are not all going to die. The cause has not yet been lost. The scientists are all very clear at this point. We absolutely do have time to turn things around. We just all have to fight which is why I have been pushing back on these representations of what we call climate fiction, because most of what is understood to be climate fiction or what people mean when they talk about climate fiction are stories that take place in a dystopian future after we screw up this moment and we don't take the action we need to take. So this talk is titled New Stories, and one of the new stories I desperately want to see and am writing are new stories about the climate crisis. Don't get me wrong. I love science fiction and fantasy, and I want those stories to sit alongside more climate fiction that takes place in the here and now and is about people, particularly people of color, taking action. And that's what I'm writing. Um, I see, here we go. I see many stories these days that are either historical or futuristic, and there's nothing wrong with any of these stories individually. But as a collective, what they point to is that we, especially in the U.S., as a culture, are having a hard time sitting with the fact that this is our moment. This is our chance to turn things around for the whole planet. And many of us feel frozen but we don't have to. We can take action. We can have an impact. I don't mean recycling people. I mean that we need to build a big movement to fight for a change in our policies and a change in our politics. I am a black woman and I fight. And the fight to make black lives matter is right in the center of the fight for climate justice. Right now, the climate crisis is ravaging black communities around the world from droughts and storms on the African continent to storms and sea level rise in the Caribbean to superstorms like Katrina and Ida and the big freeze in Texas, Mississippi and other southern states. Varshni Prakash, co-founder of the Sunrise Movement, put it this way. 
If Black Lives Mattered in the U.S., we would have already solved the climate crisis after Hurricane Katrina in 2005. But worldwide racism means that it's okay to have sacrifice zones. Black neighborhoods, neighbor, um, parts of the southern U.S., whole islands in the Caribbean, whole regions of the African continent, and the global south, particularly South Asia, the Pacific Islands, and indigenous communities worldwide. But as the Red, Black, and Green New Deal Working Group of the Movement for Black Lives says, we will not sacrifice black lives or accept false solutions that perpetuate unjust social and economic systems. Climate justice is racial justice. So a spy in the struggle is like so many of my books these days about ordinary people who have just been going along, living their lives, but something happens and they're pulled into the fight for social justice and climate justice. So I'm going to read you the new opening for A Spy in the Struggle. So you were the whistleblower, the man on the FBI interview panel said. Yolanda Vance knew he meant it as a compliment. People always did. But after everything that had happened, she wished she had kept her mouth shut. So there we have Yolanda um, starting out as a reluctant hero, right? She doesn't want to stick her neck out. She doesn't want to fight for social justice. She just wants to go along and have her individual good life. But wah ha ha, I as the author am not going to let her and I'm gonna make sure that she goes through a whole set of transformations that makes her decide that she wants to join the fight. And I want to read a slightly longer section from the story. This is edited a bit so that it flows. Um, it's a little more brief. But uh, for anyone who hasn't read the book, Yolanda is an FBI agent infiltrating an eco-racial justice organization led by teenagers. And the teens in this scene are the ones on the bullhorn and the adults are congregating on the sidelines. So here we go from A Spy in the Struggle. <clears throat> on the far end of the park, several RBG teens had created a makeshift stage by standing on a picnic table and were addressing the crowd through a bullhorn. Behind them, the concrete back of another building marked the unyielding perimeter of the park. The people, what united, what will never be defeated? That's right, the people. They chanted for a while, and then a young Latina climbed onto the picnic table and led the chant in Spanish. El pueblo, what, unido, what, jamás será vencido. I said the people, what? The young woman handed the bullhorn to Darnell, who began to beatbox, vocalizing a rhythm to go with the chant as she and another girl screamed the words from the picnic table. When the crowd heard the beat, they roared with approval. Two young men next to Yolanda began to dance in an undulating break rhythm that made their bodies look boneless and impervious to gravity. Yolanda pushed through the crowd to find Marcus and Sharon. We need to talk, Marcus said. They stood toward the end, edge of the park under a large pine tree. I don't know how to say this, Marcus began. Yolanda turned and gave him her full attention. Ay Dios, Marcus. Sharon interrupted, look at her face. You're scaring the girl to death. Yolanda, the office is bugged. As the words tumbled out of Sharon's mouth, Yolanda's mind spun, dizzy with relief. Everyone knew she could stop pretending to be comfortable. A half confession poured out of her. It's so, so terrifying to think someone could be watching us, listening to everything we say. All of us are really scared, Sharon said. In the background, Yolanda could hear the crowd singing. People gonna rise like the water, gonna crumb this crisis down. I hear the voice of my great granddaughter saying, keep it in the ground. Dana had the bullhorn and addressed the crowd. Every year, our community has had more climate refugees. We're sick of corporations like Randell getting rich off the destruction of the environment and the destruction of our people. We demand accountability for the death of Anitra Jenkins. Black Lives Matter! The crowd exploded with applause. Jimmy approached the trio of adults. Some serious shit going down, bruh, 
Marcus said. They were interrupted by a booming voice over a loudspeaker. This is the Holloway Police Department. You are participating in an unlawful assembly and you need to disperse immediately. I repeat, disperse immediately. A cordon of police began to march from the Randell lot in full riot gear. Yolanda froze. What the hell was happening? The picketers were backing away from the cops, signs in hand. Fuck the police! A young man's voice came over the RBG bullhorn, suddenly small and tinny compared to the police loudspeaker. The young black man, someone Yolanda didn't recognize, had grabbed the microphone from Nikisha. She was fighting to get it back, two handfuls of his jacket in her fists. Jimmy and Yolanda crossed the street at a brisk walk to speak with the officer with the loudspeaker. Sir, Yolanda said, my name is Yolanda Vance. I'm an attorney. What seems to be the trouble, sir? These people are just exercising their constitutional right to assembly. The cop looked squarely at both of them. Tell these people that if they don't want to end up in jail, they need to disperse immediately. My team is ready to move in and make mass arrests. Yolanda could see herself reflected in the cop's metallic shades, a distorted, convex version of herself, her eyes looking more imploring than she had intended. She put on her most crisp, business-like face. If you insist, officer, but can we have 10 minutes to get the crowd to disperse? You can have one minute. That's crazy, Yolanda snapped. You know we can't get 400 people out of that park in one minute. She was itching to pull out her FBI credentials and show them to this asshole. This is a peaceful and nonviolent protest, Marcus was yelling into the bullhorn. We didn't come here today to make any trouble with the police. We came to demand justice for Anitra Jenkins. Over a hundred camera phones were out recording. Watch out, Jimmy said and pulled Yolanda out of the path of the advancing line of blue. The police crossed the street in a long row then circled the crowd and moved in. Yolanda and Jimmy stood outside the circle, watching helplessly as the crowd constricted in on itself. This is a peaceful and nonviolent protest, Marcus kept yelling into the microphone. The young man who had yelled, fuck the police, began shoving his way through the crowd. The ripples pushed out towards the edges and the, of the crush of people, sending one young white woman stumbling toward the police her phone out and recording. An officer took his nightstick and clubbed her in the head. The phone fell out of her hand as she threw her arms up to protect herself and the crowd surged back in panic, pushing back toward the concrete wall at the far end of the park. In the background, Yolanda could hear the crowd singing, people gonna rise like the water, gonna calm this crisis down. Thank you. So one thing that I wanted to talk about for, um, a, for A Spy in the Struggle and my novel writing in general was this question of research, right? Um, my colleague from the English department who was here last time talked about doing tons and tons of research and um, writing books many years apart. And I am sort of the opposite. Um, so the biggest research that I did for this book is that I was a protesting teenager and I've been to many, many Bay Area protests. Um, I didn't want to do a ton of research about uh, the setting. So I decided I wanted to set this book in an imaginary town that would have everything that I needed for the story. Um, so I picked Holloway. <clears throat> or I should say I picked the name Holloway for this imaginary town on the other side of Richmond. And I've even set other stories there. Um, and my understanding is he talked about being a pantser, right? Someone who sort of flies by the seat of their pants when they're writing a story and sort of wanders into this unstructured space, which makes a lot of sense for literary fiction because one definition of literary fiction is that there isn't a set structure, that each book has its own structure. I, as someone who writes genre fiction, thrillers, with a romance arc, I'm working with a very, very um, specific structure, right? And I enjoy that, and that's part of how I'm able to write 
quickly. But whereas he's a pantser who flies by the seat of his pants, I am a plotter. So each of my books has a very structured outline. Um, and so what I like to do is write quickly. I pick subjects and communities that I know a fair amount about, and I write, 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 write. And then I revise many times. But one of the things that I do instead of kind of online research is I do a lot of consulting. So for example, even though I'm Puerto Rican, West Indian, and African American, and I generally write about people from those constituencies, I still get consulting. For example, my second book, The Boss, has a protagonist who's an African American woman, like me, but she's from Chicago, which I am not. So I got a black woman from Chicago to consult on the novel, to tell me like, how am I doing with these very specific details? And she gave me feedback. My first book, Uptown Thief, which is about a Puerto Rican woman. I'm also Puerto Rican, but I'm from California. So this is a New Yorkian woman, right? A New York Puerto Rican who's grown up between the island and New York. So I got a New Yorkian to give me feedback. Um, when I wrote a West Indian protagonist, my third book, The Accidental Mistress, I'm also West Indian, but she's, her roots, this character's roots were in Trinidad and Tobago. My people are from St. Kitts and Nevis. So I was like, let me get a Trinidadian to tell me how I'm doing with the language. So instead of doing a lot of online or book research, I write out of my imagination and then I reach out to people in those communities to get feedback. How am I doing? Um, for the book, um, The Mystery Woman in Room Three, the two girls are Dominican. And I know a fair amount of the Dominican Republic, I have visited, but I still felt like I wanted that feedback. And so I got a Dominican sensitivity reader to give me a read and she said, she thought it was good. I should say more about the food. So I am. Um, and the thing that I wanna say with a lot of these different sensitivity readers and consultants, I generally pay them. And I think that's really important to pay people for their time. I did have one consultant that I didn't pay because she wouldn't let me pay her. Um, Uptown Thief, all, all of my Justice Hustlers series has to do with sex work and sex workers. And um, the first book, I consulted with a woman who was a sex worker activist. And she was just excited to be able to consult because so many marginalized communities are not represented in media or when we are represented, the representations are distorted and damaging, right? So she was glad to consult. And she basically, uh, at the time, the plot had to do with, it's a heist series, and the plot had to do with um, the sex workers robbing their clients. And she said, this is a terrible, harmful stereotype about sex workers that were all thieves, right? Please take this out. And I was like, sure, but I'm like, ah, because that was the whole kind of center of the plot. But, uh, and this is what I always find as an artist, when I get feedback, even when it's hard and I have to make big changes, it always makes it better. So the new plot had to do with sex trafficking and had to do with the difference between sex work and sex trafficking, which is politically very, very important. So it made it better. Now, I will just refer in this moment about, when talking about getting feedback from marginalized communities that you're not a part of, you all may be aware that there was huge controversy about um, the novel American Dirt which was uh, written by a woman who had some Puerto Rican heritage, but primarily had European heritage and was writing a story set in Mexico. And from what I understand, she sent a pretty late version of the book to a woman who was a professor of Chicana studies that she had met and asked the woman to give her feedback. And what I wanna say is, this is very much a cautionary tale about how not to consult. Right, so first of all, it was a very last minute attempt to get feedback. Second of all, she didn't offer to pay the woman for her time. And third of all, she picked an extremely busy professor, right? Whereas there are people out there, you can find them easily online who do this work for a living and are glad to do it and can do it quickly. So I think that is, it's very important um, to think about different kinds of research. And one of the things that the woman who wrote American Dirt said 
Well, she was like, but I did tons and tons of research and this is accurate. It's very possible to do a lot of research, but when we write as creatives, we create stories that are also through our filter. So it's very important if you're writing about or creating any kind of art about marginalized communities that you're not part of to find out how you're doing. So that is a cautionary tale that I offer to everyone. And I have to say that for me, it's a real missed opportunity because American Dirt was looking at issues of immigration. And there's so much to say about that topic right now. And we need these stories. And I think of them, these new stories, as stories for the fight. So spoiler alert for my work, my stories all have happy endings, right? They don't have sort of fairy tale happy endings, but they have endings where people fight and win. And that's because I want us to win in real life. We need to read stories of winning to get ready for it. Like Yolanda Vance in the book, when she, uh, as an athlete, she likes to visualize herself victorious as a preparation for actual victory. And I want us to win in the fight for climate justice. I don't know if we will, but I will go down fighting and writing stories about victory. Some might say that these stories are too optimistic, that this whole idea of winning and that we even can win the climate fight is too optimistic, but consider this. Um, the 3.5% rule that any time 3.5% of the people commit themselves to something that you can change the, ro the world. So what is this 3.5% thing coming from? Is this some fringe leftist um, outlet? I don't think so. This is from the BBC, right? So they're talking about, um, they say nonviolent protests are twice as likely to succeed as armed conflict. And those engaging a threshold of 3.5% of the population have never failed to bring about change. So I love that. And I like to think of 3.5% as what we're aiming for. And I invite all of you to join that 3.5%. Um, moving forward, to be like Yolanda Vance, going about your business and then deciding that you want to join because it's in everyone's interest to put an end to the climate crisis and to become a functional global community that can respond to climate change. We don't know what can happen, but we can be part of making it happen. Or as Margaret Mead says, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. Some folks think, oh, but we're just not united enough. Um, but I will quote Audre Lorde, you do not have to be me in order for us to fight alongside each other. So I want to close with a video that is very much about a new story. And uh, this is, this is, um, Got it and we've lost it. Uh oh, I think <laughs> it may be the the but we can get a new window. I think the window that you logged in to get the yeah, I think that was the same window. Okay, got it. Um Intercept. Okay. Message from the future. Right. <laughs>
Ah, the bullet train from New York to DC. It always brings me back to when I first started making this commute. In 2019, I was a freshman in the most diverse Congress in history. Up to that point, it was a critical time. I'll never forget the children in our community. They were so inspired to see this new class of politicians who reflected them navigating the halls of power. It's often said, you can't be what you can't see. And for the first time, they saw themselves. I think there was something similar with the Green New Deal. We knew that we needed to save the planet and that we had all the technology to do it. But people were scared. They said it was too big, too fast, not practical. I think that's because they just couldn't picture it yet. Anyways, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's start with how we got here. 1977, New York. A senior scientist named James Black made a presentation about how burning fossil fuels could eventually lead to global temperatures rising four or five degrees Fahrenheit. Within two years, one of the world's biggest super tankers was outfitted with a state-of-the-art lab to measure CO2 in the ocean, gathering more data about global warming. Guess who was doing all of this research? Exxon Mobil, the oil and gas company. Oh yeah, Exxon knew this whole time, as did our politicians. 10 years later, James Hansen, NASA's top climate scientist, told Congress he was 99% certain that global warming was happening and caused by humans. That was 1988, the year before I was even born. So did Exxon listen to the science, including their own? Did they change business models, invest in renewables? No, the opposite. They knew and they doubled down. They and others spent millions setting up a network of lobby groups and think tanks to create doubt and denial about climate change. It was an effort designed to attack and dispute the very kind of science they themselves had been doing. And it worked. Politicians went to bat for fossil fuels and these massive corporations kept digging and mining, drilling and fracking like there was no tomorrow. America became the biggest producer and consumer of oil in the world. Fossil fuel companies made hundreds of billions while the public paid the lion's share to clean up their disasters. We lost a generation of time we'll never get back. Entire species will never get back. Natural wonders gone forever. And in 2017, Hurricane Maria destroyed the place where my family was from, Puerto Rico. It was like a climate bomb. It took as many American lives as 9-11. And in the next year, when I was elected to Congress, the world's leading climate scientists declared another emergency. They told us that we had 12 years left to cut our emissions in half, or hundreds of millions of people would be more likely to face food and water shortages, poverty, and death. 12 years to change everything. How we got around, how we fed ourselves, how we made our stuff, how we lived and worked, everything. The only way to do it was to transform our economy, which we already knew was broken since the vast majority of wealth was going to just a small handful of people and most folks were falling further and further behind. It was a true turning point. Lots of people gave up. They said we were doomed. But some of us remembered that as a nation, we'd been in peril before. The Great Depression, World War II. We knew from our history how to pull together to overcome impossible odds. And at the very least, we owed it to our children to try. The wave began when Democrats took back the House in 2018, and then the Senate and the White House in 2020, and launched the decade of the Green New Deal, a flurry of legislation that kicked off our social and ecological transformation to save the planet. It was the kind of swing for the fence ambition we needed. Finally, we were entertaining solutions on the scale of the crises we faced without leaving anyone behind. That included Medicare for All, the most popular social program in American history. We also introduced the Federal Jobs Guarantee, a public option including dignified living wages for work. Funnily enough, the biggest problem in those early years was a labor shortage. We were building a national smart grid, retrofitting every building in America, putting trains like this one all across the country. We needed more workers. 
That group of kids from my neighborhood were right in the middle of it all, especially this one girl, Ileana. Her first job out of college was with AmeriCorps Climate, restoring wetlands and bayous in coastal Louisiana. Most of her friends were in her union, including some oil workers in transition. They took apart old pipelines and got to work planting mangroves with the same salary and benefits. Of course, when it came to healing the land, we had huge gaps in our knowledge. Luckily, indigenous communities offered generational expertise to help guide the way. Ileana got restless, tried her hand as a solar plant engineer for a while, but eventually made her career in raising the next generation as part of the Universal Child Care Initiative. As it turns out, caring for others is valuable, low-carbon work, and we started paying real money to folks like teachers, domestic workers, and home health aides. Those were years of massive change, and not all of it was good. When Hurricane Sheldon hit Southern Florida, parts of Miami went underwater for the last time. But as we battled the floods, fires, and droughts, we knew how lucky we were to have started acting when we did. And we didn't just change the infrastructure, we changed how we did things. We became a society that was not only modern and wealthy, but dignified and humane too. By committing to universal rights like healthcare and meaningful work for all, we stopped being so scared of the future. We stopped being scared of each other. And we found our shared purpose. Ileana heard the call too. And in 2028, she ran for office in the first cycle of publicly funded election campaigns. And now she occupies the seat that I once held. I couldn't be more proud of her, a true child of the Green New Deal. When I think back to my first term in Congress, riding that old school Amtrak in 2019, all of this was still ahead of us. And the first big step was just closing our eyes and imagining it. We can be whatever we have the courage to see. All right, thank you so much. I'd love to take any questions. hand if you have a question and thank you so much for a wonderful lecture and uh, performance actually. Uh, Irma, how are you doing with online questions? No questions yet? Okay. Uh, we have one up there. Go ahead, yeah, please. Hi. Um, when you said that when you were writing your first book, you had trouble finding publishers that would be willing to publish and clearly you found someone that has recognized the value in your books. And could you tell us about how that came to be? Absolutely. So one thing, uh, I have a long publishing journey. Um, so I started working on a spy in the struggle in my twenties, right? So um, many years ago and the two things happened. One, early drafts of the book just weren't as strong. So I kept revising and revising and revising. The more I wrote, the better my skill set was. I was able to write a stronger, more um, impactful book. But the other thing that happened was that the literary industry was changing. There were big fights for diversity and inclusion. There were shifts in terms of the number of people of color in the industry. Um, so. Part of what happened was initially it was very hard to get published, but then as time went on, the book got stronger and the literary industry became more open and more welcoming to writers of color. Now, there's still a lot of racism in the industry. I can't you know, say like, oh, it's so great and so welcoming because every year studies come out about how much of uh, publishing is very white, both in terms of the books that are coming out, in terms of the publishing professionals, people in the industry. So those numbers are bad, but they're better than they were in many ways. And um, for me, uh, at that time, part of what I, was, what I was referring to in the lecture, one of the first things, the first set of gatekeepers that an, a writer encounters in the literary industry is trying to get a literary agent. And so when I sent my book in, 2011 to a lot of different literary agents, I got the feedback like, this is a great book, but I can't sell it, 
right? Like I'm not going to be able to sell this book or I'm not going to be able to sell it anywhere that I can make money off of it. So that was the challenge that I ran into um, initially. I'll say even a decade before that, I think, well, not a decade before, um, a couple of years before that in 2008, 2009, I approached a literary agent at a conference and I told her about my book. It's about this woman and she's a spy and she's black and it's this political organization and, you know, she gets divided loyalty. And this woman just sort of looked at me and she was like, and she, she wasn't being mean. She was like, who do you think would want to read that? You know? And I was like, well, I would totally read that book. You know, like my friends would. So she couldn't imagine an audience. So I think that's the other thing that's been happening is that um, readers, particularly readers of color, queer readers, um, have been fighting to say like, we want these books. And so those are some of the things that have really shifted in the industry. You, you often refer to inability to imagine a future and your books uh, inspire me to imagine different futures than I would imagine normally. So thank you for that. Um, can, can, you, can you talk more about the, the failure to imagine and how we, we kind of stuck and pulled back into old patterns? and the, the, the brightness of that? Absolutely. I mean, I think the way, this is part of this whole issue of new stories because however many years we've been alive, you know, those are the memories and the understandings of how the world is, how it works. Um, and over time, especially given just the disappointments and hard things and traumas that we experience, our lives can get smaller and smaller and smaller. That's why we have that picture of like the creative child with all the colors, because children have not yet been constrained in that way. And they have this greater sense of imagination and possibility and what could be. And so I think that as we get older, we have to fight to retain that sense of possibility. And that's also why it's so important to have intergenerational movements. Like, for example, if people between the ages of, say, 12 and 25 were in charge of climate policy, we'd be fine because younger people really have a stronger sense that all of the industries that are part of the climate crisis, backing the climate crisis, propping up the climate crisis, are not actually the most important things to center a society on, that human needs and having a future are the most important. Unfortunately, um, here in the United States, um, and we are the largest, we are uh, one of the largest producers and consumers of fossil fuels, the folks in charge here who are making the policy have a really skewed sense, I believe, of what is important and are willing to sacrifice human lives and the future and the environment for the profits of actually a very small number of companies that benefit a very small number of people. But those small companies and the, that small number of people um, have a disproportionate amount of control over US policy because of the way our society is set up that people with money can have greater influence. So I think that it is really important to be able to imagine something different or to be willing, like an artist, to try different things, right? One of the things that I love about that video is they talk about like not everything we tried worked. As artists and creatives, we know that like there's a first draft that meh, it's kind of crappy, but then you work with it and you come up with something that you like. Or you know, you have different projects that you scrap and you say, well, I tried something and it didn't work, so I scrapped it. Um, but that eventually, as we continue to try different things, we come up with things we like and then we come up with things that we love and then we come up with things that we can't wait to share with the world. So I think that that's just a critical piece is to be able to imagine something that's not there and to be willing to step out into that unknown and try different things. And that's, you know, part of the creative process but it's also part of the political process. One thing that I love is there's a book that came out recently called Octavia's Brood um, with Adrienne Marie Brown and Walida Imarisha. And their um, 
their thesis for this book is that every activist, every social justice activist is really writing science fiction and fantasy because they're imagining a world in the future that hasn't come to pass yet and they're world building and I love that. Um, and so they actually invited social justice activists to write science fiction and fantasy short stories of imagining this future and it's a really fun book. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Any other questions? There's a microphone up there. Oh, is there on Zoom? Questions here? Hi, um, I just want to thank you for your presentation. And I wanted to ask about consulting. So you talked about consulting people um, about your main characters. And I'm wondering if you ever think about like consulting the people that are like on the other side. So like the teens in the activist group in Aspiring the Struggle. And you know, if you've ever thought about that. Can you clarify what you mean about the other side? Um, because like your main characters are they fight for social justice issues. Um, and by the other side, I'm I'm talking about like uh the activist group in A Spy in the Struggle and like the teenagers or like Marcus, if you've ever thought about consulting or talking to people in similar situations. Oh, that's such a good question. So for in a spy in the struggle, I was involved in an organization that's very much like red, black, and green. And so I based the overall um, organization on my own experiences in that organization. But I was in that organization in my early 20s, which was a long time ago. And I got some really funny feedback from another climate activist or another climate fiction writer who I really respect who read my book and uh, did a thing on it on um, the internet and basically she called me out that I have a very Gen X style, right? That my style is very Gen X, even though Yolanda is like a millennial. And that, and I had to laugh because I know that's right, because I started writing the book, you know, decades ago. And, you know, I started writing the book, the internet wasn't as, you know, wasn't as much of a thing. and they weren't using social media and people weren't all on cell phones, you know, so I had to really do a lot of work over the years to update the book so that the teenagers would feel like teenagers now and not teenagers from back when I was younger. So yeah, I had a lot of experience with people who were doing that kind of work and who were part of that kind of community. Um, and so the big thing for me was uh, getting the generation right, you know, having sort of these millennial Gen Z characters that weren't the characters from my youth. I, I like that question. I have a follow-up question. Would you ever consider uh, consulting with the villain? Uh, would I consider consulting with the villain? That's such a good question. I think, I think the most important thing for me thus far has been to have a sense of what the villains well it depends on how intimate the villain is like the villains in um a spy in the struggle we don't have any sense of their interiority we don't get to know them another climate novel that i'm working on now that has a villain but it's a love triangle so the villains in the love triangle mm -hmm. so the villain has to be a little more um, sympathetic and appealing. So I've done more work there to think about, um, he's a fossil fuel mogul, right? And he's sort of the son of a fossil fuel dynasty. So I've done more work there to think about like what would be his vulnerabilities that he's become so heartless and is willing to continue this kind of exploitation. Um, so that's been important. I don't know about consulting, but definitely a different level of sort of humanizing and character development, right? He's not as two-dimensional. It seems, you know, the, the, the villains in um, A Spy and the Struggle are pretty two-dimensional. But part of that has to do with the fact that Yolanda starts out in opposition to this group and then she moves, right? So we're really focused on her because she starts out really sharing a lot of the ideology with 
the people who end up as villains. So I feel like that sort of moving, that divided loyalty switching sides narratives, those are always really interesting to me, especially because part of what you're looking at is why would someone ultimately align themselves with an institution that does not have their best interests at heart, right? And I would argue that with Yolanda, it has to do with trauma and internalized oppression. And so that's part of what I'm trying to do there. So Yolanda is the protagonist. She's not the villain, but she certainly starts out on the villain's, you know, on the villain's side. But I also, even with that, I didn't want to just make everyone in the FBI a villain. Like we have some really great folks in the FBI who do have her back. Peterson, um, her former mentor. So, you know, it's a mix. Thanks. More question back there and one here. Um, hi, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, I, I don't know, I like writing. So I was thinking a lot about different strategies you proposed. And um, one question I had for you after watching, listening to your talk is what your process is for like choosing what to write next. I feel like a lot of times it's just like, there's so many stories bubbling around and you don't know which one to focus on or which one's gonna be good. Or you write one and you're like, ah, this is terrible. Why did I do this? So that's my question for you. What's your process for choosing the story to write next? That's such a good question. So. The first thing that I want to say is, I want to speak to the this is terrible. I want to say one of the things that I've learned is like the first draft is supposed to be terrible, right? And so if the first draft is bad, that doesn't actually mean that the idea is bad. Um, Annie Lamott, the author way back in like the 80s, had this book called Bird by Bird where she talked about the shitty first draft. And I can say that I have become extremely good at celebrating my shitty first drafts. I'm just like on the internet, like, yes, I got a new shitty first draft. I'm so excited, right? Crowing about my accomplishment because really only through a shitty first draft do you end up with a fabulous final draft. So that's the first thing that I wanna say that I think is really, really important, um, has been really important for me and may be important for you as well. And I don't, that's, it's so different now. Um, now I focus on whatever my editor is sending me a deadline for, right? So I have a lot of books that are in the pipeline in the industry and that sort of, um, that's what organizes my writing life now. I think previously before I had the industry telling me what was going to be important, I spent a lot of years before I was in the industry, I spent a lot of years trying to focus on what I thought was going to help me get in the door, right? So I'd have four projects. One was like, oh, that's really obscure and, you know, out there. That's not, I'm not going to be able to sell that, but maybe I can sell this. So a lot of times I would focus um, on whatever felt most strategic. Right now, um, climate fiction is a lot of my focus because, you know, I'm a mom. I teach and I write, and I am really concerned about the climate crisis, obviously. So I felt like I can't quit all my jobs and become a full-time climate activist, but I'm just gonna put climate in the center of everything that I'm already doing, right? So I write about climate. I you know, put climate in the center of the courses that I teach at Cal. My daughter, I'm like, let's go be a climate activist. And so um, that's been my strategy. So really the books that go to the front of the line right now are the books that, from a social justice perspective, feel most urgent to me. For example, um, I talked about The Mystery Woman in Room 3. That book is serialized and offered for free on Orion Magazine because I started writing it at the beginning of 2021 and was like, I need this book to come out in 2021. And I could sell it for a lot more money to the literary industry, but then it wouldn't be coming out till like, 2023, 2024, and scientists are clear, like, we need to be fighting for the Green New Deal right now. So if it's a Green New Deal novel, it needs to be a 2021 novel, right? Just, and it's not that I think my novel will create the Green New Deal, but I want my work to be part of a political and cultural movement that is pushing for something, right? And so right now I would say a lot of it is, um, it's a combination of what I've sold 
and what the editor is like, we need this, and what I have on the forefront of my political agenda. And, you know, I, I've, I have six books. <laughs> this is what happens in the pandemic when you're anxious and you're someone who writes in response to anxiety and nervousness. So I have six books coming out. Mystery Woman in Room 3 is the first of six. And four of them are about climate. The other two are about racism. And so those are kind of the topics that I write about, and they both feel really urgent. So I let the political urgency make a lot of my decisions for me. And I, like, for example, I have a memoir that I'm working on, and, you know, I'm working on that too, but it doesn't feel as urgent in the same way. But also, it's really new, and it's going to take me longer to write, so I want to be sure to get these other books out as I sort of meander through working on this memoir. But it's great to have a lot of um, ideas, and it's normal, you know, to have a lot of things. And it, sometimes it takes a while to figure out how to focus. Like I talked about how when I was younger, I had a lot going on. It was hard to focus. And it took me a while, both um, in terms of personal healing work I did to be able to be more grounded and be able to focus more, but also just the experience of writing. You know, it took many years for me to develop the craft of my skill. There's so much creative confidence in how you answered that question. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. There was one more question up there and then I think we have to wrap up. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your presentation. I have one question. Do you ever include like a message or story that you don't really wanna include or that's not related to the message you wanna tell, but because it's demanded to the readers or because it's gonna be interesting to the society? Mm. Why, yes. Yes, I do. So I, um, so Uptown Thief was the first novel that I had published. And prior to that, I had worked on a number of different books, one of which, you know, was about young uh, Black women in college, and there was a relationship, and the relationship was sort of falling apart. So instead of having kind of a traditional romance arc where people meet and they get together and they have some trouble and they end up together in the end, I had a story where people, um, where the relationship was unraveling. And I decided with Uptown Thief that I really wanted this novel to get as big of an audience as possible. And that meant that I wanted it to have a very, traditional romance arc. And I, as a feminist, have a lot of criticisms of romance and a lot of concerns about romance. And there are things that I, um, there are things that I think can be negative about romance. But I decided I wanted to take it on because romance is something that sells well and a lot of women read. And I really wanted to write books that women were going to read. So I took it on and it was really fun and exciting to figure out how can I take this set of tropes of romance and make them my own and make them interesting to me and make them feel feminist and subversive. And I feel like I've been able to do that successfully with all the books. You know, um, A Spy in the Struggle definitely has a romance arc and the publisher that publishes the books publishes a lot of romance. So it also made it, it was effective in making my books more publishable and finding a certain kind of audience. So yeah, that was something that I took on because, you know, I felt like it was an external thing to me, but then I made it my own and that was really fun. Thank you for your Thank deeply you. inspiring talk and, uh, I, 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 we all are deeply thinking and deeply energized. So thank you so much again for coming and sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you.